everyone. There we go. Oh, Hindi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, I'm sorry it's been so long, but it's just been a very busy few weeks, so I'm very happy to be here We're tonight. Time to go, right? We're I know. Hi, Gail. Okay. Hi, Rebison. How are you, Yitzhak? Good, thank God. How are you? <laughs> it's so great to see everybody. Wonderful to be together for this week's edition of Around the Shabbos Table. And once again, we hope and we pray we continue to look forward to when we're going to be able to be at the Shabbos Table for real and not the virtual version of the Shabbos table, but we are very happy to be able to spend this time together each week. And this week, we're looking forward to an amazing time and a wonderful conversation. But first and foremost, I see that Lauren and the Glons are on, and I just want to take this opportunity to, first and foremost to thank Russell and Lauren, our dearest friends and our most wonderful neighbors. We hope we're not too loud. We hope we're not too... Can you hear us from, from across the street? <laughs> but for sponsoring tonight's around the Shabbos table. Thank you so much for your generosity. And we so cherish our friendship. And, you know, the Mishnah Perkyavo says you should have a Shachin Tov. You should have a good neighbor. We're blessed with, with you as wonderful and terrific neighbors. So thank you so much for your generosity and for your friendship and uh, for sponsoring tonight's program. This is Lauren's second thank you this week because I texted her earlier in the week. Lauren, thank you so much for having your trees cut down because it provided an hour of entertainment for my children. <laughs> And I wish the Siemens were on because today's entertainment is that the Siemens are putting in new windows and that was very exciting for us. <laughs> you could tell we're very busy over here. So actually, um, one of the parts of the entertainment just uh, as we're getting started tonight is when we think about, so the trees that you had cut and, and you know, cleaned up the uh, shrubbery there in a beautiful way. So it's interesting that I was talking to my kids about it that, you know, we had this when there was the hurricane, you know, there was, there was all type of uh, herbage that was strewn all over and trees and branches that were strewn all over. So it's interesting, you know, Lauren, I was looking across the street when I saw the, the uh, you know, freshly cut and beautifully trimmed um, agriculture as it was. So when it was first cut, so the trees were still green, right? Because of course it was still fresh. So I was able to get not just one lesson, but a few lessons with my kids about it. Because after a few days, <laughs> what did we see? We saw that the, obviously the leaves turned brown and they, and they died. So I said to, to my boys this morning after a minion, I said, what pusik, what verse do we uh, remind ourselves of when we see these trees, when you look at these trees as they are? So what, what verse, what pusik do we think about? to put my kids on the spot down there. I see that they're not on the, uh, on the Zoom call here, so I would call on them live and, and in the flesh. But what's the Pasuk? So, that the tree is the tree of life, and we should cling faithfully and steadfastly to it and towards it. And what happens when a tree is connected to its roots? So it's green, and it's, and it's connected, and it's, it's alive. What happens when it's cut off? So sometimes we, we get the sense that when it's cut off from its source, so it's free, and it's, you know, it's, emancipated from the bondage of for which it is connected for which it is held down what happens in a short period of time is that you know it turns from green to brown it goes from life to death and so therefore unless it's connected to the source and that's just truly a metaphor for life that we're connected and, and, and you know really connected to the tree of life and the tree of life is the Torah and the elixir that guides us and inspires us and even though sometimes people like to be free from the Torah they live a life that seems to be free from the Torah. We all know that the metaphor of the tree that turns from green to brown is also the metaphor of life and death. And the ability to have life is when we're connected to the source. So thank you for that, that lesson and for that, you know, wow. the, the entertainment of that. <laughs> you didn't even exactly, know. <laughs> exactly. And so with that, we uh, are so happy to share tonight's wonderful program. And thank you again for your sponsorship. So tonight's host, Hostess with the Mostess, who is the star of the show every single week. It is... My dear and beloved Aisha Chayel. Take it away, Jen. Okay. I feel like Chatzkel always misses the question. Let's get him on. Okay. Okay. Hi, everybody. So last week we were left with a cliffhanger in the Parsha. Um, we, we ended off the Parsha that Pinchas did the famous act that he killed um, the, the man and the woman. And the, we didn't know yet at after last week's Parsha, whether or not this was okay or not. 
and we had the whole Shabbos to discuss whether or not this was a good thing that he did or was it a bad thing that he did. And only in this week's parsha do we see that Hashem condones the behavior and calls him, you know, true to to justice and that he did the right thing and that he is a Rodef Shalom, like his grandfather. Um, and so now we have to wonder what about this was so wonderful and how today, you know, if you think about doing something with such zealotry against maybe what anyone else would think is the right thing and having so such clarity that even though the world is doing one thing, I know that this is not L'Shem Shemaim. I know that I have an opportunity here to be Makadi Shem Shemaim, to make a Kiddush Hashem. And I don't think that we usually have the guts to really stand up against when we see people doing the wrong thing. And for sure, we're experiencing this now during this pandemic, I think more than ever in my life, you know, being able to still remain strong, even if things are slipping around you and remaining strong and teaching your children the right thing to do, even when people aren't, even when religious people aren't, and even when, you know, intelligent people aren't, how do we, as Jews, how do we stand up strong to things that we see that are going on around us, injustices, both religious and secular injustices that we see going around? How do we have that strength, like Pinchas, um, to do something that was for sure unnatural to him? It's not natural that someone would go and kill people. And he had such a strong understanding and conviction in what the right thing was that he was able to go ahead and do this. How today in our day and age are we able to have such conviction and stick to our guns and be able to make a Hashem in that way? Hmm. <laughs> that's the doozy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's a doozy. What an important question. If we only had like a few minutes to prepare it together, <laughs> that would that, be that, much. That, that, that's what makes it fun, extemporaneous. Um, and I would just say, by way of introduction, any of you who have comments and questions and add-ons and, and theories, please feel free to text me along this broadcast. We're glad to hear and share and, and learn and grow together. So it doesn't have to be a one, one-sided one uh, conversation. So listen, I mean, there's so much to learn from the parasha, parasha's Pinchas. And it's true, you know, t- we tend to, rem- to think that the uh, parasha begins with the zealotry in parasha's Pinchas, but actually it's the reward of the, it's the schar, it's the measure of, you know, Pinchas' steadfast commitment to Hakadosh Baruch Hu and, the, and the, the what's right and virtuous. It happens at the end of last week's parsha, and he, you know, famously with zealotry and conviction. And, and I think that what we're seeing is a variety of different things in the world we're living in now. I mean, we we definitely are seeing people that have conviction. We see people that are standing up, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's you know social injustices in other continents, whether it's anti-Semitism. When you have an NFL player that quotes about Hitler, you talk about you know, current events as they happen, and the need for us to understand how to channel and to really kind of um, appreciate what it means to be a Pinchas. There's a zealotry that everybody needs to have when it comes to the values that we stand for, when it comes for what's, what's just and moral and upright, and, 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 and do it in a sophisticated and a scientific and, and in a um, diplomatic in a promising way. Now, it doesn't always mean that the things you stand up for are going to have the results that you want them to have. You know, there's a lot that goes and there's a lot of commentary to explaining what Pinchas did in the right, <clears throat> excuse me, the precise moment and, and the, you know, the correct energies and the, and the philosophy. You know, you, when you're disciplining somebody, for example, so you have to be in a specific state in that, in that state of discipline. You know, for example, you know, you're, if you're disciplining a child, so you have to be in a place of calm, not disciplining somebody, a child from a place of extreme anger or, uh, you know, being vengeful or, you know, with nakama. But it has to be with real discipline. The person you're giving tochacha to, the person you're rebuking, has to be a person who's willing to accept that tochacha. Now, there wasn't time for that. Sometimes there's, you, know, have to, you have to act, you know, quickly. You have to act fast. You have to act with, with real conviction, with speed, and be resolute. And sometimes what happens when you have all that together, you, you tend to make mistakes. And I think that there's really what I've always considered as 
what, what's worth standing up for, what's worth fighting for, what's worth raising your voice for, is something that people don't spend enough time. I know there's a number of people on this call now that have spent, whether it's professionally or in volunteer, you know, standing up for the needs and, and the, uh, the places that the Jewish people would benefit most from, <clears throat> whether it's fighting for summer camps, whether it's fighting for you know, Cap Capitol Hill, for uh, tax exemptions, whether it's fighting for, for schooling and funding for children to be in yeshiva day schools, whether it's funding for whatever worthy cause, you know, we've championed cause, cause after cause. And I know some of you on the call are, are ardent and, and specific and particular about your involvement. And I think that it's few and far between. What I think one of the, the plagues, and I don't use that word lightly, of our religious or, or socio-religious um, environment is that there's a lot of lethargy. There are people that are either religiously lethargic or socially lethargic, or they're you know, emotionally lethargic. I've often wondered like, what is it that gets people going? And I think that that's so important to see. I'm inspired when I see people peacefully protesting for a cause. Forget about the, the commentary and the politics. Let's like park that. That's not you know, certainly a conversation we need to get into now. But the idea of just being hakol, kol Yaakov, the voice is the voice of Jacob, and the voice of Jacob is what was given to us to use. What do you stand up for? What do you believe in? So that I think it boils down to the three G's, not just G because Gibber's my last name, but the three G's that I've often used as like kind of like the guiding principles for myself and I think for others and trying to help people manage what it is. Hold that on. I promise you he did not come up with this before. I'm like shocked that he has three G's already worked out. I promise you, I'm in shock. How do you have three G's worked out? <laughs> Isn't three G a network, Matthew? <laughs> three G's a network, that, that, that works, no? Unreal. So, the, so the, the three G's that I think are guiding principles that I think are very important for us, you know, to, to like be mindful and to be hopeful and to be, you know, kind of, uh, very, very specific. <laughs> G's, guts, number one. Guts, I don't know. The three G's you need is you need goals, goals, you need to have a grid, and you need to have grit. What are the three goals? The, what are the three G's? The first is you have to have goals. You need to know what, you're, what do you stand for? What, what, do you, what do you want to accomplish? What are your goals in life? What are your goals with your spouse? What are your goals with your children? What are your goals yourself religiously, physically, emotionally, socially, economically? What are your goals? A person who doesn't have a goal, a person who doesn't have an ambition, a person who doesn't have a vision. So you're literally left in the dark of just, you know, nothing. I was talking to somebody today who, uh, who I love very much. And I was, I was, I had to drive somewhere today. I did leave the bunker for a little bit for uh, something uh, important and I was, I was driving and I said to this person, you know, sometimes I, I like to just get in the car and drive. So this very dear person to me said to me, you know, so I don't like to just get in the car and drive. I need to know where it is that I'm going. Now, obviously it depends on who you're with. When I'm sitting with my Asia's Chayla, I'm just happy to drive and drive and drive because the goal of that, of that drive is just to be together and therefore where I go is irrelevant. But it's true, when you get in the car and you just like get on the 95, you get on the turnpike or you go somewhere and you're just like, where should I go? I don't know, should I go left, should I go right, should I go north, should I go south? You're like lost and you're just, there's no place to go. So you need to have a goal, you need to know, have a vision, you need to know what do you stand for? What, what, are, you, what are you about? What's your DNA? What's your, what's, your, what's your compass? Where are you headed? What are you doing? That's number one. Uh, upon figuring out what you have in the goals is you need the grid. What's the grid? The grid is what you need on your grid to get you towards your goals. So you map it out. What do I need to do? Who are the people I need to be close to? What are the career ambition, you know, systems that I need to set up for myself? What are the economic pro programs that I need to make sure that are set? How do I discipline myself? If I want, for example, to know Shas, I want to know Chamishe Chum Torah. I want to learn Hebrew. I want to learn how to lane. I know somebody here is learning how to lane for the first time. So what are you going to do? What's the grid? What time are you going to allow for that? What, what instruments do you need for that? You know, what, what kind of emotional and physical support do you need for that? What kind of financial support you need for that. That's the grid. And the grid, obviously, all these points can be further embellished. But the grid, and then finally, which is no less important, which I think is the ultimate ingredient. It's like the chocolate chips and the chocolate chip cookie. Without the chocolate chips, there's no chocolate chip cookie. And that's the grit. And the grit is obviously, I'm very uh, enraptured by the writings of Angela Duckworth and the uh, book that I'm like knee deep in and the name of the book is Grit and here is for a there it is okay <laughs> for your visual taste buds um, Grit is is the study of what it takes 
It's the power of perseverance. It's what causes you to get from point A to point B. What are you made of? So you know what your goal is and you know what the grid, what's on the grid, you know what's on the map, you know what you need to do. But do you have the stamina? Do you have the gravel in the gut? Do you have the grit? Do you have the grind? Do you have the effort, the energy? When the going gets tough, like how are you prepared to do it? So that, re- that you have in so many, many areas. I mean, you have it in sports, you have it in, in politics, you have it in interpersonal relationships, you have it in, in, you know, in, in, in domestic relations and in international relations, you have it all over the place. And to what extent a person has the ability to persevere, and there's so many examples, just the most recent example in, in the book, she tells the story of, sorry for those who aren't sports fans, but uh, once a sports fan, always a sports fan. Anybody ever hear of Steve Young? So Steve Young was the backup quarterback to Joe Montana for years. Now imagine, you know, in the NFL today or in any sport, you know, Steve Young for certainly a quite quite a number of years, he could have easily gotten a big contract, gone to another team. He could have been the head honcho, the chief of staff, the big, the big, you know, big bankroll. They just uh, signed the quarterback to the Kansas City Chiefs for $510 million. Oh, unbelievable. Totally crazy. Unbelievable. So, uh, you know, this guy could have easily been. He was the, you know, backup quarterback for famous Joe Montana. And anyway, he himself MVP, Super Bowl champion, threw the most touchdown passes in the history of NFL Super Bowl games. But here's what's amazing about Steve Young, besides the fact that he's an NFL pro bowler, a Hall of Famer. He was, Matthew, you know where he went to college? You know where he played college football? Come on. He went to the BYU, Brigham Young. He's a religious guy, actually. And what's interesting, when you think about a guy who was a Super Bowl champion multiple times, MVP, Pro Bowler, Hall of Famer, most Super Bowl thrown quarterback you know, touchdowns in a, in a Super Bowl, he, was, he went to BYU. He went to Brigham Young University. He was the eighth string quarterback when he came to BYU. And the story he tells, as she writes in the book, is that you know, when he came to the campus and he was told he was the eighth string and he was a superstar on his high school team, he came home and he told his parents. Now, I don't know if you're going to believe me, and probably this is why she's in the book. His father's name, if you can guess his father's name, he's got a real name, but the name that his people, his friends in the world calls him, his name is Grit. G-R-I-T. It fits in perfectly with the book. Steve Young's father's name is Grit Young. So he said to his father, he says, I'm number, Tati, Abba. Let's assume he calls him Tati or Abba. He says, Tati, Abba, I'm done. I'm eighth string quarterback. I don't have a future. He says, that's fine. You don't have to play professional football. You don't have to play college football. But just you can't come home. <laughs> like he said, you, but you can't come. Because that, that's just not what we stand for. That's not why my name is Grit. That's not what Grit stands for. That's not what Grit is. You got to... There, there are hurdles to, to yeah, you got to dig. There are hurdles to climb, to, to jump over. There are mountains to climb. There is, you slide down the mountain. You scrape yourself back up the grit. So I think it's those three things: the goals, the the grid, what's on the gridiron, what's on the grid, and finally the grit and the and the gravel and the gut that it takes to kind of get there. When you have those things identified, you know what it is, what you stand for, then. As the Gemara says famously, that that the place that a person wants to be, Hashem assists him, Hashem guides him, Hashem puts that person in that place, and you can do great, unbelievably life-changing, world-changing things, literally, if you put your mind to it, goals, grid, and grit, the three Gs. I think that's the hard, the hardest thing for people is, it's easy to get inspired, it's easy to set goals. But taking it to the next level, I think, is where everyone has the hardest time. I, I'm in a class where we do a lot of, like, goal setting, but we have something called, like, your grid. It's called your, you have to set your PMR. It's your practical and measurable results. So this is my goal. What do I do, actually, practically, that I can write down on a piece of paper to do? What can I do to actually see results from my goal? Because it's so easy to set goals. How often do we set goals and not actually fulfill them because we have no plan. We just get excited, we get inspired, and then it gets like lost into oblivion. But when we actually can map it out and even have you know dates that I need to get to this point by this time, then it becomes more real. And I think that's something that people really struggle with and probably why we don't have that zealotry that you're talking about, that lethargy is like the, the inability to really get to your goals. But do you think that it's lethargy only, or do you think it's also maybe we're sometimes even too tolerant? Like we live in a world that we, we want everyone to be tolerant. We want to accept everybody and we do, but sometimes maybe we're too 
tolerant and permissive of what people do that are wrong because everyone has to do what they can do but maybe there's too much of that might be it might be you know i i think that there's there's what to be said for that you know i think you know to straddle the fence of being sensitive and open-minded and conscientious and careful about who people are and what the context of you know where people find themselves <clears throat> there's no limit to how much people can show that sensitivity and way too much do we find that there's fractures there's there's bifurcating that there's you know you know um, putting people in certain segregated categories we don't like it ourselves and we're putting those categories and certainly we unfortunately fall prey to doing that to others whether it's within our own people within our own nation within our own tribe or whether it's how we castigate at other people as well we don't like that for ourselves and we certainly shouldn't do that but I, I think that there is a little bit of that people are are scared to you know today to say anything about anybody or any way um you know, so much so that you know that 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 you know you almost find yourself that you have to be now you should be, and we should be all careful about what it is that we say. The Chavetz Chaim writes extensively about. Sometimes we know the siag lechachma is shtika, that the safeguard and the fence of, of you know chachma of wisdom is shtika, is silence. And sometimes we like, you know, motor our mouths way too fast and way too quickly that we realize that we've said things we shouldn't have said. But that that being said, yeah, there's there's a certain tolerance that we need to have, but there's a certain sense of. Yeah, you, you can stand up for something. I, I, it's the difference between disagreeing and being disagreeable. We can disagree and, and be on the same page, you know, socially, and we can have a great friendship, but being disagreeable is where things become hostile and contentious and there's animosity and there's machlokas. That's sad, and that doesn't have to be. And I think that requires, you know, you should stand, we, we have to learn to stand up for the things that we believe in and to do it in, a, in, in the rhetoric and in the communication and the communion of what is respectable and respectful. So it's not just being disagreeing, but it's being disagreeable. I think the disagreeable part is where things get crazy. And certainly today where things are, everything's politicized, so it seems, and everything seems to be so unclear and nobody knows where we're getting information from and what to do with that information. And you should do this and you should do that. And there's an uptick and there's numbers of this. So yeah, everybody is the master of their own interpretation and they have so much to say based on what their own measurements are that it's very hard to like to discover the truth you know what's the truth and that's what we search for and that's what we're looking for as jews is we want to look for the truth not just the truth but the the only singular truth the absolute truth as it exists there is no gray there's no gray in the world of what the emes is and the truth is we are given gray to work within the construct of how the jewish people function but the absolute truth is that it's day and that it's night, and that it's a weekday, it's chol, and that it's Shabbos, and that there's simcha, that there's happiness, and that there's, you know, that there's unhappiness, that there's righteousness, and then there's wickedness, that there's the contrast of a hagid baboke chastecha ve'emunos chabalelos, there's day and then there's night. So yeah, I think there's a lot of that. I think it's important for us. I love that, that acronym. You guys got that? P-M-R. Practical. Practical. Measurable. Measurable. Results. Results. If we were to vote, what's better, the three G's or the PMR? For sure the PMR. First of all, she's much sweeter than I am. She's the sweetest thing ever. And so PMR is much cooler than the three G's. Three G's already. Got three G system. Okay. So I was on the same topic I was reading. Um, I, I saw a good question. Not, I didn't see the answer. Um, so maybe you can help us. So Pinchas had two grandfathers. One was Aaron and one was Yisro. Okay, so and it said, why does the bracha that that Hashem gives to Pinchas after committing this act of killing two people, the the bracha that he gives him is that he's going to enter into the the covenant of peace, and peace we know comes from the grandfather of Aaron, like we said before. Why wasn't he? Why was the bracha specifically bringing down from that lineage and not from the other lineage, which might have made more sense because Yisro came from idol worshippers, and the whole idea of killing the people was, you know, to get rid of the idol worship. So why does why doesn't Hashem attribute that his act towards his grandfather Yisro, and instead calls him after his grandfather of peace? It would seem like Aaron would be the opposite of what Pinchas did killing two people, why is it being called peaceful? Yeah, I think that's great. I actually think that that accentuates even the greatness of Aaron even more. Because we would, we would be unsuspecting of him being somebody who would epitomize that. You see, sometimes we make the mistake that what peace means 
is the absence of war. Making everybody happy. Yeah, everyone's happy. And, and we all know, like, I, you know, my parents remind me all the time, like, when you go into the rabbinate, you're, you're not going to be able to make everybody happy. And that's a big torture for Yaakov Gibber. I'd like to make everybody happy if I can. Oh, my gosh. I hate not making everybody happy because I love everybody. And the last thing I want is everybody to be uncomfortable. But the answer is in life and in world and in shuls and in communities and leadership, you just can't make everybody happy. And it makes me, nothing makes me sad. His grandmother used to say, um, the rabbinate is not for a nice Jewish young boy. <laughs> it's not a job for a good Jewish boy. I'd say, thanks, grandma. What, what do I do now? She's like, I don't know. Are you want to go into the egg business? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so I was like knee deep in it. We're, so we're, we're moving on. Uh, it, it's, just, it's, not, it's not easy to do that. So peace doesn't necessarily mean the absence of war. And actually one of the earliest sources of that is, you know, when, uh, when Lot and there was this separation with, you know, Lot and Avram, and you're going to go this way, and I'm going to go that way. What happens as a result of parties separating is that there was peace. Now, it's not the ideal necessarily. You want people to come together, but sometimes the absence of machlokas equals peace, and sometimes that means that parties can't coexist. By the way, that doesn't mean that they weren't willing to be there for each other, right? Was there not the saving of Lot, Avram, you know, like Saddam, and Amor, like there was the saving. There's a brotherhood. There's there's a care for each other. There's a davening for each other. There, you know, there, there are people that could be your nemesis, that could be your, your theologian nemesis, that could be your, you know, your your political nemesis i don't know this is your brother your sister that person's you know in desperate need you're gonna you're gonna run into the enemy minefield and you're gonna save that person throw that person on your back and there have been scores and scores of examples of, of that and, and where that um where that was i remember uh, reading a story where my, where my riskin tells a story about how there was a congregant of his and i'm blessed that i don't have any of these but there was a congregant of his that was like just he and him they just didn't see eye to eye on anything about everything and it was just like the worst worst relationship you could possibly have and uh, you know i can't even imagine bar hashem any of that bar hashem a hundred million times so he says throughout the course of his rabbinate that this guy like you know he said hot the other guy said cold he said chalt he said kishka he said anything that could antagonize the rabbi that's what he did he said that this fellow had a massive heart attack, massive heart attack, and he was taken to, uh, I think, a Presbyterian Hospital in New York, and he goes to visit him. That's when Rabbi Riskin was still the Rav in, in, in Lincoln Square Center before he met Aliyah to Efrat. And he went to visit him. And he was like in the ICU, like, you know, there's special privileges. Cur clergy gets to go in, of course, the ER docs go in, family goes in. And the guy was like, he sees the rabbi, it's like his nemesis. All, all this guy wanted to do was to get the rabbi out of his position. And here he is, he's like hooked up to tubes. He's like very precarious. His life is hanging in balance. And he looks up and he sees the rabbi. He says, rabbi, what are you doing here? Like, you know, what I, it's like checkmate. You know, what are you doing here? I, I, you're happy to see me in this state? And the rabbi said to him, he writes in his book, he says, it pains my heart to see you like this. You are my brother. We might not get along in topics and issues and theology. You think this way about me. And frankly, I think this way about you. But let me tell you something. While you're in this hospital, while you need, I'm right here with you. He said they became very, very, very close friends after that. He recovered and they were, you know, very close. Because I think what happens sometimes, sometimes unfortunately, there's so much rhetoric, there's so much politics, there's so much stuff that gets in the way. Think about, okay, the people you care about, but maybe care less about, but the people you're closest to, the people that you, you, you love so much. I mean, what, what COVID has done, certainly from what, I, what I've heard, just uh, around and in our community, just it's put people's differences like really like on a monumental magnified way on the, in the face of the other person. And that's really bec become very much a great sense of friction. And that's re required people that the people you care the most about, the people you love the most, whether it's your children, whether it's your parents, whether it's your spouse, whether it's, you know, extended family members and friends for that matter. Friends. I mean, there, there was uh, the case of of somebody who shared with me that their best friend um, did something that they felt was was ethically highly immoral and they just how do I maintain a friendship of my she said it's her childhood girlfriend from literally like grade school and you know she got on an airplane and she didn't wear a mask and she was COVID-19 positive and she thought she might have infected an entire airplane and this is like way at the beginning of this thing and she said like I, I can't even be friends with this person Again, specific example aside, but I do, I think that there's, uh, it's telling of, of Aaron, that Aaron was, uh, to be an Ohev Shalom, to be a Rodev Shalom, um, to be a person who pursues peace and, and, and genders peace, you got to realize that sometimes there are people that you can have a, a, 
a precipitous uh, disengagement from. And that doesn't mean that you, I, I love you no less, but I just, maybe we're not going to be able to, we'll sit at the same Shabbos table and we'll definitely enjoy our, each other's company and topics that maybe we can find a mutual, a mutual interest. Um, and, and I'll say this, and then I'll turn it back over. Um, I'll say this, which is, um, you know, everybody knows that in, in Boca, that the, through the Federation, we have a cohort of, of different, you know, rabbis. We sit together with different denominations, right? We sit, everybody's familiar with that? Um, that we sit together several times a year. Unfortunately, I'm able to do that because not, we do that on Zoom now, but we don't uh, do that live. But a couple times a year, and uh, really shout out to the people in the Federation who made that possible, and the rabbis and different denominations sitting at the same table and kind of kumbaya and, and sharing. And it's interesting. So for many, many times, we sit together and we share topics that are parv, benign, easy. So it was once brought up at a meeting, like what would happen if we kind of talked about some thornier issues? Like what would happen then? So a lot of us like jumped up real quick and said, you know what? There's something very beautiful about this. That doesn't mean we can't have dialogue and have an intellectual you know, stimulating conversation for sure. And, and I'm proud to say that I've had those conversations with some uh, of other denominations very rigorously and you know, sometimes more successfully than others. But I think that there's something they said. We, we sit around the table, we kibitz, we kumbaya, we try to find what's positive. And, and that's good. You know, sometimes it's easier to find the things that are separate and negative and distinctive about each other. Better for us to spend some time thinking about it, certainly now. What are the things that unite us? What are the things that make us similar? What are the things that bring us together? So I think the Aaron example is why we draw the lineage from Aaron because the paradigmatic Ohei Shalom and the Rodev Shalom is the Aaron HaKohen, who's the person who being peaceful means that sometimes it requires you to take, to, to take matters into your own hands. It doesn't mean that if you're, I'm not saying, we're not, we're not, advocating violence, chas v'shalom. You know, the Israeli Defense Force is a very peaceful army, but okay, many times their backs have been forced against the wall and they have to do things that they, that we all wish, that they wish that they didn't have to do. We, you know, when they send pamphlets over, over certain communities to uh, warn them of the impending, you know, grenades and, you know, surface to, to, to air rocket launches and things of that sort. So they're doing that as a humanitarian army. Tell me another army in the world that does that. They, it's with pain that they have to arrest and kill and do what they have to do to keep people safe. And when you're pushed against the wall, you got to stand up for what you believe in. So what do you believe in? What do you believe in? What are things that matter most? What matters most, most is everybody's lives matter. You're Hispanic, you're Black, you're Jewish, you're Chinese, you're, whatever, you're French. Everybody's lives matter. What is it that you're willing to stand up for? So for most of us, it's, it's for Holocaust, um, the perpetuity, to remind ourselves. For us, it's Eretz Yisrael. It's the land of Israel, the homeland and the heartland. I think that those are, you know, clearly core. Those are soul. But obviously, what we stand for is the Chamishay Chumshay Torah, is the five books of Moses. What we stand for is the Torah Shibach Sav and the Torah Shibach al we, we stand for our Mesorah, for our, our tradition. We stand for being links in the change. chain. We stand for passing the Mesorah to our children so that they're inspired, not lethargic, uninspired, care less about anything, but really care so much about anything and everything. And I'll just end with this and then I'll turn it back over to our awesome, uh, wonderful host here. You, know, you guys remember a number of years ago when... Um, Michael Oren. So Michael Oren spoke at Cal Berkeley. He spoke at Cal Berkeley a number of years ago. How can you remember that? He spoke a number. He was the then ambassador. So he spoke at Cal uh, Berkeley. Um, um, was it Cal Berkeley? He spoke? Yeah, it was Cal Berkeley. He spoke. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you, Chasco. Cal Berkeley, and he got up there, and he was giving this riveting, you know, talk. You can actually Google it. You can YouTube it. And what happened is that a number of students who had plant <laughs> Take me out to the ball game. So a couple, a couple, uh, you know, students for the Justice of Palestine, right? And if you remember that, they planted themselves, you know, very ceremoniously into various places in the audience. There was a sizable crowd that was assembled to hear him speak, and very choreographed, person after person, they got up and they, you know, filtered and unfiltered rhetoric against the, you know, Michael Oren. And it was, it was a, a terrible scene to see. They were talking about, you know, Israel and they were talking about apartheid. They're talking about a whole host of just different, you know, um, 
obviously geopolitical concepts and topics. And they were up. And then once the campus police came to silence the one protester, one students with Justice in Palestine, so they got them. And then another one got up. And it was like, it was very choreographed. It was very well planned. And I think there might have in total been five, six, seven students that went to that rally. They made a ruckus. And that what, that's what made news. So I don't know if you remember. I'm sure, uh, you know, Linda probably remembers. Linda has a good remembrance of all my drushes. I always make sure. I have to double check on Linda. Did I say that? Linda remembers if I did. And even if I say it over again, I know Linda always laughs at my jokes again and <laughs> chuckles at my stories. But if, but I remember saying at the time, what obviously it's painful to read about the story of the students of the Justice of Palestine standing up and protesting Michael Oren. But I got up and I gave a sermon that, that next job. That's not what upset me. That's not actually what upset me. Obviously it upset me. It upsets all of us. But you know what upset me more than that they stood up? What upset me more that those students st stood up is that how many Jewish kids were in that crowd, in that audience as well, that not one of them stood up. They don't know about pre-67 borders. They didn't know about what the arguments. It's, it was like these, pals, these, child, these kids, those students for, the, students for the Justice of Palestine, they were very, they seemed educated. They knew the topic. They knew their story. They knew their language. They knew what they were passionate about. And not one Jewish kid got up to say, sit down. That's not right. That's not correct. They're quoting Psukim, they're Ezekiel this, and Isaiah that, and, and Jeremiah this. I mean, these Jewish kids, like, come on, a little bit of Jewish literacy. Get up and feel, you know, proud a little bit about what it is that you stand for. So I was upset not only that those students got up in protest, but that there were no Jewish kids that got up to rebut those protests. So we got to stand tall. tall. We got to be literate and, and strong and, and passionate and have goals, grid, grit. So that reminds me of something that I learned today in Mechtav um, Meliahu. He talks about that there's that, that people crave order and there's three reasons why order is necessary. So let me just see if I can remember this. So the first reason people like order is because it just feels right to them. It just, you know, they, they, it brings their inner self to feel like they're in order, even subconsciously. And the second reason he said was um, that it helps you find things better. So when you have order, you can get to what you need and it keeps you organized. So there's purpose to the order. And the third thing he said is that you need order, like when you think of a machine. So you need all the parts to be exactly where they are for the actual machine to work. Or else if, if it's not exactly where it's, where it's supposed to be, then the machine won't even work. And he said that in the spiritual world, it's the third order that, that guides us spiritually. And he gave the example of the, the the order that was the jewish people in the midbar so you had all the shvatim in an orderly fashion you know certain shvatim in different areas next to different shvatim with different you know personality traits and goals and they were all in a circle around the center and what what was in the center was the mishkan and he was saying that in the spiritual world it doesn't work without this type of order and what he means is that we can all have different roles and we can all do different things in our Yiddishkeit, in our humanity, but we have to have the center as the same. We all have to look towards the center and have Hashem as the center and then it works. And then it, it's a, a machine that knows how to produce properly. So, so I think that this, that wraps up the whole conversation because when you see, when you talk about tolerance versus lethargy, you know, are we being too tolerant or are we just being too lazy? And you think of these students, you know, it's not okay to not know what your Judaism means to you. It's, it's, it's lethargic and you, we can't be tolerant of that type of, you know, innocence or, you know, of, of that type of just irresponsibility of not knowing what you stand for, not knowing what your goals are. We can't, we can't have tolerance for that type of, um, you know, just, just living life without these goals, without the three G's. Um, we have to have goals and we have to be, make sure that we are, even though working differently towards that goal, we all have the goals and we all work towards that same center of the Mishkan in the middle, the Hashem is in the middle. And, and I was telling this over to a friend of mine and I said, that's why Jewish people dance in circles. We all hold hands. You know, you don't see a circle dance in, in other cultures. We, we hold hands together. And we dance in circles because we say we are all equidistant from the center. We are all equidistant to Hashem. 
who no matter, we all have different stripes and colors and we all have different ways of living out our goals, but we have to have goals and we have to have, you know, a way of living them out. And, and as long as we hold hands and we do it together towards the same purpose, we could still sit around the same table and we could still have these conversations, but we have to be able to have the three G's. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's <laughs> awesome right there. That is super awesome. Wow. That's super awesome. So you have to hold hands with people that maybe you might not necessarily see the world. Right? Have you ever been to a wedding where people are holding hands? Like, Susan, I look back and like, by the way, can we like switch spots with you and somebody else? No, you got to hold hands with somebody that even if they're not, I love that. That's genius. Oh, I'm so happy your mom's on the call because she can stop it. <laughs> you are just brilliant and wonderful in every possible way. I do want to just um, make a comment from one of, uh, one of you that really just sent me a text message. I think hits it right also right on the part. And that is Dear Chatzko, who sent me, in order to really find greatness, a person has to challenge their own inhibition. So on one hand, you know, we describe Aaron as somebody who personifies with his Ohev Shalom and Rodev Shalom description. He must, obviously, you have to push people away to be able to do that. But maybe there's something else. And this is also great. You got to challenge yourself. And I think that's the idea of holding hands and something centered and really pushing yourself to find something that maybe Dafka, because Aaron was an Ohev Shalom, right? Chasa, correct me if I'm saying, hopefully I'm saying correctly, that because he was an Ohev Shalom and because he's a, a Rodev Shalom, he was a man of extraordinary, extraordinary and exquisite peace. So now Pinchas, that's his Zaydi, that's his Opa, that's his grandpa, that's his, that's where he's from. So like, it's like what, what, I, what I'm thinking about when you write that, you know, it's an impossible task for anybody, but it's an even more, a greater challenge for somebody, an even bigger, surmountable challenge, seems to be insurmountable of a challenge if you're the grandson of the person of, of peace. Mm -hmm. And the greatness of Yaakov Avinu, when he said this, and I'm thinking, the greatness of Yaakov Avinu is what? Titain MS Yaakov. He's described as a man of truth. All, all, all of us. All of us were exactly tested in exactly what their strength was to be able to do like something that opposed their strength. Right. But where did Yaakov Avinu become Yaakov Avinu? When he has to defy what seems to be the, the truth. Okay. He t his mother and his father, and I'm really as a cold call Yaakov, it is I, comma, Asa, wherever you put that comma, that famous, most commas, punct I think it's the most popular, uh, you know, most famous punctuation mark in the entire Torah. Where you put that comma is it is I, comma, Asa. Oh, he didn't lie, it wasn't. But um, it was because it was so difficult for him. It, he wasn't dubious or devious or you know he was truth he was a man of truth and therefore sometimes when you have to uncover it's so difficult so not only not only is it the Yaakov becomes great but he becomes like super great because of that I think because of and I think Chaska, I think that's what you're saying I think that's great so Pinchas shows his greatness and that's why Venasati Brisi Shalom I'm gonna give you the covenant of Shalom you know what Shalom is not only is there peace but Shalom is also one of the names of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. You know, Shalom Aleichem. Shalom is Hashem's name. I'm going to give you the covenant of my name, Pinchas, because in you is me. And despite the fact that your nature, your grandpa, your Zaydi, your Opa, your, your ancestors are the definition of what everything is that you have to now opposite go against, the antithesis of that is you're given the covenant of me, the covenant of peace. I think that's really powerful. Thank you so much. Um, good. Linda adds, we also have to educate our children so that they know the questions and the statements to ask. That's 100% true. I totally agree with that. You're right. Unfortunately, what happens is that, you know, there isn't enough of that. They have to be inquisitive and they have to be curious and they have to know what to ask and how to ask and when to ask. But sure, you know, sometimes what there is is so much, um, there's so much noise and, and there's, the, there's the, the rhetoric that's missing and the curiosity. Um, which is why, you know, we talk Pesach night about it. It's a night of asking and questions and children and back and forth. And I've often said that, you know, it should never be that there's one night a year or in the diaspora, it should be two nights a year that kids are asking questions. I agree with you. You know, unfortunately, what happens is that Zion still children, at Pesach night, they come with their, their, their binders like up to China and you know, up to, up to Shamayim and they're now, and they're like literally, you know, asking every single question. By the way, why, why is there a man that managed to oh, We celebrate that. Well, so we celebrate yeah. asking questions, but to, to really celebrate those questions, I think you're right, is you have to educate your children so they know how to ask and, right, not just Pesach night, but every night and, and always. And in every endeavor. So. And that's through discussion and around the Shabbos table talk. And you bring in the Parsha. And these Parshas are so rich with good conversation and moral dilemmas. And what would you do if this is the type of conversation that you want to 
have with your children and, and you build character that way for sure, Lynn. I totally agree with you. That's our job as parents to, to get the kids to, to question and to ask and to grow because you only, we said last week, you only, you only grow when you struggle, when you like struggle through a question that you, you know, that you're struggling with. So I'll throw one last comment question out to, to all of you, um, if anybody's interested in sharing. Anybody of you stand up for something ever in your lives that was fraught with challenge and perhaps some concern? And at the end of the day, like you just, when, the, when all was said and done, you can look at yourself in the mirror and be like, wow, I am just so proud. Despite the outcome or because of the outcome, I, I'm like so proud of what I stood up for. Anybody ever experience that where you just like stood for something, you put your spear in and you raised your voice and you Linda, did something, Linda, Linda. something, I want to hear share something. You're just so proud of it and it inspired wait, you, wait, inspire wait. us. Can you unmute yourself? And Chasko, you're next. Hold on. Okay. Okay, there we go. Uh, when I was a member of the Reform Congregation, Bethel, I was extremely unhappy and disturbed by what was left out of the services. There were many things that they just kind of skipped over. And I took a stand and I said, this is what belongs in the service. And so we used to make a deal. I could get that put back in the service if I chaired a, uh, a function. And I got a lot of things put back into the service that yeah. were, and the, I don't know whether they're still doing it, but it was tough work and I, they, you know, everyone was on my case, but I believe that they were missing a whole part of the service because I didn't belong in the reform aspect of, of Judaism. Um, I was there as a compromise, but I, I worked hard for it. Wow. That's amazing because that I'm sure was not popular. I'm sure that was. Oh, never it wasn't. A yeah, lot when, of I, when I first went there, um, Merle Singer didn't wear a yarmulke. Wow. It was not part of his, but he started wearing one. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. That's a great example. Haskell. How Wait, we have to un hold on. Okay. Could you share one? How could I? How could I give a better story than what just was said? That's a great one. I want, that, that, that's I want to stand. I want to stand up and cheer for such that a story. A that, it's an amazing one because it's okay, and that's life altering. Because Linda you. has the three G's. Yeah. Woo! I cannot compete with Linda. Not even a chance. <laughs> Mark, <laughs> Mark, 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 Mark wants to compete. <laughs> Go ahead. Tell us something. Great. I'm not going to compete. <laughs> What? He's not it's sort of in a different level. I, I know a lot of us, and I've been in this situation, we've been with friends, we're in a crowd of people uh, having discussions, someone makes a joke or a comment that has racist undertones, sometimes overtones. And what do you do? Do you stand up and say something about it? And I remember once a while ago, I didn't stand up and I felt very bad about it. And I said something to someone afterwards. But from then on, I do make it a point if I feel something is blatantly uh, bigoted or nasty, I will uh, just state my views about it. So, Good for love you. It, love it. I, and that's, it's a difficult situation to be in. But very that I felt good about once I started speaking. Costco, tell us something great. Also, you got Mark. That's great. I love and uh, six months ago, there was an extremely uh, well-reported, large, probably the largest gathering in the last many years in New York City. It was called the No Hate, No Fear March against anti-Semitism. It was an outgrowth of many, many, many months of anti-Semitic um, attacks against identifiable Hasidic and Haredi Jews, people getting beaten up, people with hats getting pushed off, uh, people coming home from shul, going home at night on, at Tish, just one attack after the other. And finally, the New York City Jewish community, so to speak, got together and decided to do this kind of gigantic rally. And very few 
identifiable Orthodox Jews wanted to participate for various reasons. We're not going to get into it. They asked me to do it. And I said, uh, I really don't think you want me to do it. No, no, you have to do it. Checked in with uh, some very big people and they wanted me to do it. But I warned them. I said, if you're going to do it, if you're asking me to do it, just letting you know it's going to be Frank Sinatra. It's going to be my way. <laughs> and then I got up there and I let 20,000 people let them know that if they are allowing identifiable Jews to get beaten up and their voices are silent, and when they stand up and scream against anti-Semitism, what are they really screaming against? Are they supporting and defending yarmulke-wearing Jews? Do they really, really care? And I knew I was going to get criticism for it, and I didn't care because I had asked the people I wanted to ask, and I thought it was the right thing, and it had to be said, and it was said. And I have no regrets. And not only that, I'm proud that I stood up and it wasn't the popular decision to make. It's not always easy to make an unpopular decision, as Rabbi Gibber can tell you. <laughs> That's a and great some story. of my kids, too. And if anybody wants the uh, transcript of Haskell's speech, it was so spectacular. I loved it. It was so powerful. And I loved you sharing with me. But it, Thanks it, for embarrassing it, me. I love you. <laughs> Thanks for standing up for the Jewish people. who We need you. You're the best, the best, the best. Okay, what an amazing, uh, amazing night. I want to hear all of you and I appreciate it. I myself have to excuse myself. It's time for Mincha. You have a question? You have a question? Come no, on. I was going to say something that I, that I did. Um, right, Karen, this will be our Maya Machronim. This will be our last but powerful story. Go for it. I don't know about how powerful. It was for me. Um, when Karen's mom passed away, no one in her family was there to recite Kaddish, so I took it upon myself to say it for the year. And, and this was in New Jersey. And during the week, I went to a shul where I made sure that there was a minion on Shabbos. I, it was where, where I usually dive in. But during the week, it wasn't a place that I wasn't used to going to. And when they, whoever it was that was re reciting Kaddish, I went up to him afterwards and I said, you know, you just like... It was like so fast. And I said, is it really necessary? You know, I'm sorry, I don't really mean to offend you. Is it really necessary to recite Kaddish that fast when it's so important? And he said, looked at me and he really didn't know me. He said, you know what? And I thought, oh, here we go. He said, thank you so much. I didn't even think about that. I've been doing this for so many years that I just automatically just shoot through Kaddish. And so that, that was a... I'm still welcome there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. That's great. But that's a humble person that he was able to, to hear oh, that. Oh, it was amazing. Yeah, amazing. That's, that's really great. Not so easy to find that, unfortunately. No. So wonderful you. to see everybody tonight. It's been a wonderful Thank conversation. Thank you for coming. We hope to see you next week. Are we going to have a uh, baby showing? Uh, I have to check if he's up. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> that's why well, we come. We come to see yeah, this, this I is, hope I see him before his bar mitzvah. <laughs> just the previews of the of the show. This is not the, <laughs> this is not the main. Oh, here he comes. They're coming. Anyway, I hope everybody stays safe and healthy and well and strong and positive because positive energy makes positive things. So stay strong, stay holy, stay happy, stay healthy, and let's be positive. Main, main. All right, hang tight. Here comes Jen. Hold on one sec.